Okay, thank you again for, for the kind words and especially for the invitation. For those of you that have been Zooming all day long, thanks for putting up with this. Hopefully we can make it worth your while. Um, I am at Johns Hopkins. I am a consultant for Baxter Scientific. Um, and, and today, you know, it's, it's a pretty exciting time to be doing thyroid surgery. And I remember as I was, I was, I was graduating from residency, I, I told people that I wanted to do thyroid surgery and parathyroid surgery. And every single resident says, well, isn't that really boring? And Dr. Orloff knows that that's not boring. And it's a certain kind of person that goes into thyroid and parathyroid surgery. And Dr. Noel is apparently one of those people too. But you, you partly, you're a little bit perfectionist, but partly you don't think it's boring. But what I love especially is that in the last five years, thyroid surgery has changed completely. And, and if you think about it, that's huge. We always, we always talk in residency you as in, during training, we say, if there's a really good operation, there's one operation. And if there's a hundred ways to do something, that means it's not a really good operation because everybody's trying to change it and do it differently. And the fact is thyroid surgery is a really, really good surgery. And that's why it, since Coker did it, you know, 130, 140 years ago, it hasn't changed almost at all. You still make a, ver or a horizontal incision, you divide your straps, you take the thyroid out, you protect the parathyroid glands. Yes, we've added energy devices. Yes, we've added a nerve monitoring tube, but essentially the surgery itself hasn't changed. And you, you think about the Mayo brothers and you think about Halstead here at, at, at Hopkins and you think about Kryle, at, at the Cleveland Clinic, and you can name other names of incredible surgeons that really built dynasties and built hospital systems based on their ability to safely do the same surgery that we do now. And then you think kind of what Dr. Orloff alluded to, to the changes that have happened in the last five years and the changes that will happen in the next five years, it's incredible. It is a fantastic time to be a thyroidologist and to be doing doing anything in inter intervention on the thyroid. So today we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about some of the innovations and, and what, what are the steps to innovate in the thyroid. We'll talk about some of the state of the art things that are happening. And of course, with Dr. Noel and Dr. Orloff, I'm, I'm not going to really give you anything that you all at Stanford don't know already because they of course are, are the leaders in this field as much as anybody in this field. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what may still be coming and what might still be brand new at all, for all of us. And then kind of a little bit for me, just this constant decision of getting pulled in a million places because there's too many cool things happening at one time and trying to just hold on to one thing and just do one thing well, because you can't be leading at every single thing, even though you really want to so desperately. And so as, as I have thought about thyroid innovation, it seems like there's a few prerequisites. And when you talk to people, especially head and neck surgeons, and I, and I think Dr. Orloff and Dr. Noel will probably second me on this one, that, that when you talk to general surgeons, I think they recognize that there is a need to focus on thyroid surgery because they don't get a lot of it in training. But for head and neck endocrine surgeons or head and neck surgeons in general, we get a lot of thyroid surgery during training and we get a lot of neck surgery and most of us feel very competent taking out a thyroid. And so to, be, to try and convince people that, you know, maybe you need to do, really subspecialize on thyroid and parathyroid disease is a challenge and a, and a career in and of itself. And I am grateful to Dr. Orloff and people like her that have made Dr. Noel and I be able to have a career in this space within head and neck surgery. But as, as I think about what we can do to really take the next steps with our field, it feels like there's a few arguments that I have to make over and over and over when I'm talking to people. And the first one that we, that we have to convince people is that any innovation that we're making is safe. We aren't gonna be doing, and, and really the bar is set so high by existing thyroid surgery, right? Because if you have any complication in thyroid surgery, Everybody in the hospital talks about it for a week. You can do 500 surgeries and all of them can go perfect and nobody says a thing. But it's like you're a stinking offensive lineman and the only way that somebody knows that you did that your what your name is is if something goes wrong in your thyroid surgery because thyroid surgery is super safe and it has to be safe because of of the low morbidity that comes with the disease itself. 
So that's the first prerequisite. Then it has to be oncologically sound. And, and that's because thyroid cancer is a very indolent cancer, but it's a very curable cancer. And so if you're going to bring an innovation into this space, you can't be doing something that is less safe than what we have, that we know our patients, you know, 99 and a half percent of them are going to live forever and never die of thyroid cancer. And so if we're bringing a new innovation in and all of a sudden those numbers change, well, then we, we probably should be rethinking what we're doing. And those are just kind of the ground base of what we have to be thinking about before we innovate. Then you have to say, okay, well, if you can meet those prerequisites, well, thyroid surgery is safe, it's cheap, it's easy, everybody can do it. What value are you adding when you're talking about innovating in the thyroid space? And so you have to very clearly define the value that you're adding. And then finally, it shouldn't be too expensive and it shouldn't be too hard. This should be something that multiple people are able to pick up and run with and actually make it happen. So let's, let's start off just by talking about like, and this, this first part, I'm going to talk about the cancer part first. Is it oncologically adequate or non-inferior? And that's very difficult to, me to demonstrate because of the observation trials that are ongoing, both in the United States and also in Japan and other international countries, where, where as we look at them and we say that small thyroid cancers, we, with the objective of first doing no harm, we know that most small thyroid cancers are never going to do any harm to our patients. And in fact, intervening and operating on small cancers is more likely to cause a permanent nerve injury or a permanent hypoparathyroidism than doing nothing over about 20 years, at least if you're a Japanese patient. And, and in the United States, it's hard to disagree with that when you look at this graph as you see the incidence of thyroid cancer go, going through the roof and the mortality from thyroid cancer being essentially stable. And so these are things that we have to remember and, and so how can we innovate with small thyroid cancers? That's kind of the paradox is that that oncologic safety of the tumor itself also allows us some, some wiggle room to be able to innovate and bring in some new technologies and some new techniques. And these are just the, the techniques or the, the numbers that we alluded to on that last slide. Um, when you think about other things that you can do with thyroid, can thyroid cancer and other innovations and other changes, and things that are happening that really set the, the basis for everything else that we're going to talk about. We know that molecular markers are one of the huge changes that is going to happen. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but we know as these thyroid markers get better and better, we know that we are going to very soon be able to say exactly which tumors need to have surgery and which ones we can continue to watch. Not only that, we're going to know which cancers need to be operated on and which cancers we can watch. And especially we're going to know which cancers need a lobectomy and which cancers need a total thyroidectomy. And so all of these things, you know, you, you bring in artificial intelligence, you bring in ultrasound, you bring in all the, these new things that you can do. And it really creates this space for innovation that is co co completely ongoing. Um, th this, is a, this is something that I think is very important to remember as well. And, and as we think about being safe with our patients, this is just kind of a, a step back just a little bit to remember that sometimes the less we do, the better off we are. And that if you're a low volume surgeon and you're doing a total thyroidectomy, your complication rate is about 25%. Whereas if you're a high volume surgeon and you're doing just a thyroid lobectomy, your complication rate is going to be about 7%. And so there are choices that we can make that help to keep our patients safer and help to allow us to be able to intervene. Now, we, we talked a little bit about some of the other things that are coming as far as machine learning. Uh, this, this is a, a, a graph about a really important thing about how you can learn from algorithms and when you can eat the food that falls on the floor. We also know that we're getting better and better. Uh, Dr. Beth Cottrell at, at Jefferson in Philadelphia is looking at machine learning and ultrasound. There's some ongoing projects with colleagues in South Korea as well where there's some really cool things that you can look at a thyroid nodule and you can tell the probability of that thyroid nodule being malignant. Um, we've done some projects like that with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo as well. And a lot of these algorithms and a lot of the machine learning that you can build in with by answering a few simple questions, you can really make a lot of progress down the pathway that you need to get treated. So these are just some of the innovations. And, and there's so many things coming so fast and furious, like we talked about, it's hard to pick. 
one of the other things, and kind of before I dig into what I really want to talk about, one of the other things that I'm really excited about right now is parathyroid autofluorescence. And parathyroid autofluorescence is incredibly attractive because we know that parathyroid glands, there's, there's really two complications that come with thyroid surgery. And one is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And the other one is low calcium after surgery. And we know that if we could see those parathyroid glands better and protect those parathyroid glands better, we would do a better job, hopefully, of helping our patients avoid what is actually the most common iatrogenic complication of, of thyroid surgery, and that would be hypoparathyroidism. And so there's a number of products on the market right now uh, that, that are actually looking at this. We're actually in the middle of, of working on a grant right now for a, a new handheld device that's hopefully going to help us be able to identify parathyroid glands. And not only that, we hope it's going to be able to help us identify blood flow to these parathyroid glands and determine whether or not they're still vital and, or whether or not they've been devascularized and we need to auto transplant these. And we're hoping that that will hopefully match up with some of the other things that I'm gonna to talk to you about in just a second, which is the transoral thyroid surgery um, and be able to combine this with some other filters that we can use um, to be able to really help us as we get guided into this next generation of surgical intervention where hopefully we have some guardrails up to keep us safe from, from some of the complications that we cause. And again, thyroid is just such a great space to be innovating in as we're talking about all of these different things. Okay, so let's, let's take a step back. Let's take a breather. We talked about how it's important to be oncologically sound. It's important to be safe. Uh, we're going to dig into the details about safety in just a little bit. But one of the things that has happened throughout my time as a surgeon, and ever since even before I was a surgeon, was this, this push and these crazy thoughts about how you could get at the thyroid. And uh, one of the earliest talks that I ever remember hearing uh, was from Dr. Shaha at Memorial Sloan Kettering, gave his talk about all the goofy ways that people take out a thyroid. And of course, he finishes with his punchline about, oh, you're going to take out a thyroid through the rectum. And you know, everybody laughs and it's a hilarious talk and, and he's an incredibly gifted speaker. And it's true that everybody over the last 20 or 30 years has tried an incredible array of techniques to remove the thyroid because despite what Dr. Coker did with his excellent and elegant incision, it does leave a scar in the middle of the neck of what is usually a, a young female patient. And for that reason, it has created a demand to find something that is different, something that may remove the scar from the middle of the neck and put it somewhere else. And we've tried all sorts of different approaches. And, and here at Hopkins, we've tried a number of these different approaches. But really, just like we talked about earlier, if there's a million ways to do something, that probably means that none of them are perfect. And so as we've gone from the simple coker incision to look into the next idea, the ideas have proliferated, but none of them have really caught on with any great uh, proliferation, at least here in the United States. Now, for my career, of course, timing is everything in a career. And for me, I was very fortunate as I was a fellow, uh, there was a paper that came out about halfway through my fellowship year from Thailand that was a single author report of a new technique called transoral thyroidectomy, transoral endoscopic thyroidectomy vestibular approach, or TOWITBA, as, as Dr. Anyuan called it. This was halfway through my fellowship, and I was working with Ralph Tufano and Jeremy Richmond, and I kind of said to him, hey guys, this is a fellowship. We're supposed to do crazy things during a fellowship. Otherwise, why are you doing a fellowship? That's what you do in fellowship is you push the envelope. Otherwise, I know how to do thyroid surgery. You know, I've hung out with Ralph for the last six months. I've done 300 of these stupid things. Can we do something different? And so we took a little trip over to Thailand. And within about 15 minutes of watching this surgery, we kind of switched from saying, this is going to be a funny way to talk to people about how you can do thyroid surgery. I, in my mind, within 15 minutes said, oh my goodness, this is a real way to do surgery that you can do quickly and elegantly and safely and it might actually be something worth doing. And so even though the pictures that we're gonna look at here are going to look a little bit barbaric, and even though the surgery itself can be a very elegant procedure, 
with an excellent outcome that the patients get what they want. And that's what Dr. Anyuang showed in, in his paper was he was able to show that there's a very low complication rate, both with re regards to hypoparathyroidism and with even just temporary recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries. And he was also able to show that the procedure can be done in a relatively quick amount of time. Um, and as you see these things, you start to think, okay, well, maybe this is something that we could do here. I, I will also tell you that one of the things that I was impressed with as I watched this surgery was the fact that it's able to be done without a robot. And I love the robot. I think the robot is great. And if Chris Holsinger is on here, I especially want to be kind about the robot. I don't know if he's made it out of his central neck dissection yet. But, you know, thinking about the robot, it's a beautiful thing. And clearly we are all going to be brushing our teeth with robots in about five years. But for right now, a robot is expensive and it's a finite device. And if I want to spread the gospel of how to do thyroid surgery, I can't really use a robot because we do a hundred plus thousand thyroid surgeries every year and we don't have robotic capacity to do a hundred plus thyroid, a hundred plus thousand thyroid surgeries each year with a robot for every single one of them. However, when you watch Dr. Anyuang operate, he's using devices that they have in Thailand without necessarily some of the same resources that we have here. And instead he's using the resources that every single community hospital that does laparoscopic surgery he's using those devices. And as you see those, you say, hold on, this is low hanging fruit. This is something that all of us potentially could adapt and could utilize. So we brought it back to Hopkins and we started to do it. And this gets to our second point, or actually our first point, if you'll forgive my transgression there, the first point that it has to be safe. And so this is our publication, our efforts comparing remote access surgery to, trans, or to the traditional approach. And what we did over a, a couple of years this was published back in, in 2018, so this is a couple of years old, was we were able to establish that even as we were beginning a brand new technique at Johns Hopkins and bringing this to essentially everybody that wanted it, we, we still had no permanent nerve injuries and we had no permanent hypoparathyroidism. And so we, plant, we were able to plant our flag and say, okay, you can make fun of us, that's fine, but at least what we are doing is safe and we are not hurting patients. And so it, it buys us a little bit of wiggle room to keep innovating and to keep working on that. And so as we've gone on, this is, this is a newer paper that we just published last month. Uh, and, it, and this is comparing a couple, actually it's not last month, time, time has flown. It's been a few months now. It's probably six months old already. But th this, this was published and, and really kind of shows we compared 200, we compared over the last four years before this paper was published the cases of every single patient who was eligible for transoral thyroid surgery at Johns Hopkins. And I'll get into the eligibility criteria later when we talk about it, it can't just be a niche procedure. But anybody at Johns Hopkins that came into my clinic that was eligible for transoral surgery, 200 of them chose transoral surgery and 333 of them chose something else. And this compared kind of our safety profile across the board. And what we found was that other than the operative time being longer in the patients who chose transoral thyroid surgery, there was no significant difference in any of the complications or anything else that happened to any of these patients. And so we again, continue to be able to afford to have this space to be able to innovate and be able to see if we can get it to a point where it actually brings some value, which is really our next point. This is kind of breaking down. This is this is already six months old as well, but this was when we were, had not quite crossed the 300 mark. Now we're pushing 350 transoral thyroid procedures, and I guess that includes parathyroid surgeries as well. Uh, we've started taking this to other things. We've taken this to uh, cistrunk procedures. Uh, really, you can do anything that you need to do in the neck through this procedure. Lateral neck dissections, we'll get to why I don't do those in a little bit, a little bit down the line, but I more and more am convinced that this is just another way to access the neck, and it is something that can be done very safely, and that it's something that we need to have in our armamentarium. Now, let's come back a little bit now that we've talked about safety and kind of set the stage for everything. We talked about that Japanese data. We talked about how small cancers really don't cause that much of a problem. Now, let's move forward into 
what has happened with our cancer patients that we have treated with this? Are the outcomes oncologically equivalent between my open cases and my transoral cases? These are the patients that we've treated so far, or at least as of August, who had had thyroid cancer uh, that, that we had treated with transoral surgery. And you can see that somewhere in there, we got a, a medullary thyroid carcinoma mixed in because on preoperative fine needle aspiration, it was called to be a benign nodule. And on final pathology, it came out to be a four centimeter medullary. And somehow by the grace of God and by nothing else, her, her uh, calcitonin postoperatively was non-detectable. And so I will not take any credit for that. And I will instead just give all, all praise to somebody greater than me because that was, that was just a gift. Uh, but, but fortunately you can see this, these are the cases that we've had. And these are the, the outcomes that we've had with them as we go through. And we know that as we're trying to define equivalence between them, we have a few tools to look at to be able to say that transoral cancer cases are equivalent to our normal follow-up cases. And thyroglobulin is kind of the easy one, but that is only applicable to patients who have had total thyroidectomies. And right off the bat, we're kind of limited to some degree in that regard because of the fact that with our transoral thyroid surgeries, we have been very selective about who we offer this surgery to. And I generally will only offer this surgery to patients who have a cancer that is smaller than two centimeters. And as you're familiar with the American Thyroid Association guidelines, if you have a cancer that's smaller than four centimeters, usually an isolated lobectomy is adequate surgery. And so we have a relatively small number of transoral patients who have undergone total thyroidectomies and have a thyroglobulin that we can use for oncologic surveillance postoperatively. Um, we can use ultrasound, and that's really the next step. Are we leaving residual tissue behind? Are there, is there other pathology that we're missing in the central neck that we would have found if we had done open surgery? And then, of course, nuclear medicine imaging is something that also can be of value if we're leaving tissue behind. And, and we've gone through and we've compared this, and unfortunately, like I mentioned, our numbers are low to be able to com compare our transoral surgeries versus our open surgeries. But what we found is that across all three of these measures, we had not seen any inferiority between the transoral surgery and the open surgery. And so again, we buy ourselves a little bit of space, right? And so we say, at least with this innovation of transoral surgery, we've proven that in our hands it is a safe surgery and we've proven that it's not inferior to the current standard of care. And so when you have those two things, all of a sudden you can say, okay, now that we've established that, let's make an argument. Is there value to be had? Is there some way that I can convince my head and neck colleagues that maybe this is something worth talking about? Because now at least they're making fun of me, but hopefully they're not like looking down their noses at me and saying, oh my gosh, what is he doing? He's going to hurt his patients. And that's really what this is about. If we're going to move into convincing people to actually move forward with this, we've, we've got to march along. And so to make the case for adding value, we really have to turn to the people who have done this more than anybody else. And that's actually oftentimes our South Korean colleagues who are really leading in a lot of ways, the care or at least the innovation in remote access thyroid surgery. And so this paper, which is a few years old now, asked patients who were status post thyroid surgery, how they felt about their scar and their outcomes, which were, were widely poo-pooed by almost everybody, were that patients who had a scar in the middle of their neck, no matter how well it healed, had an impact to their health-related quality of life that was as significant as if they had psoriasis, vitiligo, or severe atopic dermatitis. And so they published this paper, and it kind of hit the U.S. like a rock and kind of didn't go anywhere. And nobody and in fact, I, I, as I gave this lecture one time, I had a, a, an endocrinologist stand up from the crowd in the middle of me speaking. He pointed at me and said, that's BS. And, and I, you know, and I said, this is not my data. You know, this is data that was published from another group. But I will tell you anecdotally that when we only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And for in the United States, where we hadn't really adopted a lot of these remote access approaches, we were, and my entire career through residency, we told people, your thyroid scar is going to heal great, it's going to disappear, and you won't even think about it. And that's what we told people over and over and over, because that's what we had to offer them. And when the Koreans dug into it, the South Koreans dug into it a little bit, they said, you know, maybe patients actually care, even if it heals well. 
this this is and and there's a number of paper we've done a few papers there's been a few papers that have kind of built up over time but this is actually my favorite because it was published by a gentleman who really doesn't like transoral surgery um, <laughs> he's an endocrine surgeon who who was asking patients about the number one thing that went wrong after their thyroid surgery and I love that the number one thing that went wrong after people's thyroid surgery was that 80 percent of people thought that their scar looked bad and so I, I thought that that was a phenomenal number and that when you talk about all things that people care about after surgery, 80% of people, I mean, yes, most people that get thyroid surgery tend to be young and oftentimes they're women. And, you know, we, we, in our minds, we kind of pigeonhole this one group of people that get thyroid surgery, but 80% is a lot. And 80% includes the grizzled old guy that I had to take out a cancer on earlier today. And, you know, all the other people that just have big, huge goiters. And if you're 80%, that means people really are thinking about their scar. And I love this study. And so we at Hop, and there's other great studies that have kind of come out of University of Indiana asking people five years after surgery and finding that, you know, most people think their scar looks okay. And I don't know, but I'm anybody that knows Dr. Orloff and Dr. Noel will understand that okay is not really okay, right? AT&T did a whole built a whole series, a commercial series about this. Okay isn't okay. And if you're an okay surgeon, you're probably gonna be out of a job because people are looking for surgeons that are the best. And so if your scar looks okay after five years and I'm the surgeon, I should be thinking, what can I do so that my scars look better than okay? And that's really the next thing. How can I get better? And so at Hopkins, we wanted to find out, do people care about scars? What happens? And we, and we borrowed some tricks from uh, actually from Silicon Valley as we were doing it. And one of the things that we did was we asked people to look at pictures of patients who had a scar and then look at pictures of patients who didn't have anything done. They had not had any surgery at all. And we had a couple hundred people look at these pictures and say, what do you think? What values, what characteristics do you assign to the patients who have a scar on their neck? And what we found from asking those 200 casual observers was that they perceive that people who have a scar on their neck are less attractive and they perceive that they have a lower quality of life and that they on average would be willing to pay more than $10,000 so that they did not have a scar on their neck. And maybe that $10,000 means something, maybe it means nothing at all, but we thought that that, that scale means that it defines some sort of value that people can converse in that two some people that are staring at somebody with a scar, they think, boy, I don't want to have that. That person's less attractive, and they probably have a lower quality of life than I do just by virtue of the fact that they have that. And those are the kind of snap judgments that we would like to help our patients avoid when they're buying groceries in the checkout aisle. Those are the kind of things that patients can feel self-conscious about even years and decades after their thyroid surgery, and uh, including the fact, well, well, there's too many things to talk about. This is an exciting topic. So our, our next thing that we did after defining that some patient or rather casual observers would be distracted by a scar and would prefer not to have one. The next thing that we did was we dug into looking at infrared eye tracking, because when you're looking at a Google ad, of course, they monitor your pupils and see what you're focusing on and how long you pay attention to it. And it generates a heat map of what you're paying attention to. And what we found was that observers looking at a thyroid scar pay attention longer to the central neck instead of the central triangle, which is where communication actually happens. And so we were able to replicate this in a couple of different studies. And what we found was that having anything in your neck draws the eye away from this central triangle, which is where we want people to be looking. And so you can see this patient on the far left had a traditional neck scar. And it actually healed very well, if you can't really tell through this picture, but her neck scar healed very well, you can still see that the eye is drawn down. This patient in the middle had scarless thyroid surgery, and you can see that she, the eyes are all focused, the heat map is all here in the center of her face. My favorite, though, is this patient on the right, and she didn't have any surgery at all, but she has a mole down here that can, draws the eye away from her central triangle. And it kind of shows you how little it takes to draw the eye away and to distract communication. And really our hypothesis 
is that this is part of the value that is added when you do a scarless thyroid surgery is that you lose that, that, that impairment, that impediment to communication that you would have if people were instead thinking, why does he have a scar on his neck? What is going on? What did he have done? Because we don't really want people to think about that. Okay, so now we've covered a lot of ground, but we've hopefully covered the first three things that we talked about. And that was hopefully, is it safe to do? Then we talked about, well, hopefully, yes, it's safe to do. Then we talked about oncologically sound. And hopefully we were able to say, yes, it is oncologically sound, perhaps because thyroid cancer is just very indolent. We don't know for sure, but at least with the five years at Johns Hopkins, it is equivalent to what we've been doing so far. And then the next thing that we, we talked about was, does it add value? And that's a hard one. And it's a very individual thing, but at least for some patients, it seems to be that it adds value. And that value can be objectively measured both in dollars and also in pupillary distraction, or we call it attention distraction from the central triangle. And so maybe there's some value. And so we've established kind of our first three tenets. And so now we're moving into, well, it's got to be really expensive and it's got to be really hard, right? And that's why not everybody in the U.S. isn't doing it, because if it's too expensive, nobody will do it. And if it's too hard, nobody will do it. But if it's cheap and it's easy, well, then probably people will be doing this more and more. And so we kind of dug into this at Hopkins and what we found was that at least with regards to equipment, there's really not too much difference in the supplies that we use. And then when we look at the amount that we build across our first 20 cases, what we found was that really there's not that much difference until you add the robot into the case. And all of the difference at that time could be explained by the increase in operative time. Um, so then you get into operative times. Well, that means it must be really hard. It must be taking a long time. What we found was that at least for us, after about 10 or 11 cases, we had crossed that first plateau in operative times. And our operative time started to reach this nice steady state with a slower curve that has since been continuously decreasing across time. And you can see that that, that trend has continued. And if I was to draw that trend out even further, uh, it, it's kind of reached a point where now cases take as long as we have allotted for the case to take and as long as resident education needs to allow it to take. And so that's kind of that happy academic medicine state of thyroid surgery, where it takes about as long as it takes me to do normal open surgery. And that's kind of what we want. Um, we, we tried early on to, to predict what factors were going to be involved in making a case longer so that we could guide future surgeons maybe learning this technique. This is a paper that a couple of the med students that you all just interviewed helped, helped us put together. Um, but this is, this is a paper, and what we found was the number one thing that held up across multivariate analysis was that the size of the thyroid nodule that you're taking out, the size of the lobe that that nodule is in, that is the number one thing that affects how long your surgery is going to take. And then when you add in on the other things that kind of fell off after multivariate analysis were the BMI, the, pre the preoperative cytopathology, and then whether or not the patient had Graves' Uh, Graves thyroiditis. And those are things that seem to be related, but don't hold up across multivariate analysis. And they, they're all kind of common sense. And they kind of build into who should we be offering this surgery to as we're starting this. Um, taking one small step away, I think it's important to compare this technique to all of the other existing techniques as well. And so we went back through Hopkins and compared to some of the other techniques that we had historically tried there. Some of my predecessors, you know, Ralph and, and Jeremy Richmond back when he was doing the, the facelift approach uh, that Dave Terrace kind of popularized. And we kind of compared and what we found was that operative times of the facelift were really pretty stable. We didn't really see a plateau where things started to get any better. And we saw that patient satisfaction scores were significantly lower with that. They had more pain, they stayed in the hospital longer and they were more likely to use drains. And so for, for kind of some soft reasons, they didn't have a lot of complications in those patients, but for some soft reasons, it seems like the transoral approach was better accepted by patients. And, and I will tell you, I think for me, the number one way that you know if a procedure is good is every once in a while, we have a patient who needs to have a completion thyroidectomy. And when we were offering them facelift when I was a fellow, if you did a lobectomy with a facelift approach and you found a cancer that merited a completion thyroidectomy on the other side, I never was involved in a single case where a patient said, yes, you should do a facelift approach again. Every single patient said, you know what, just make a scar. That's fine. <laughs>
With transoral surgery, it's the opposite. After doing 300, more than 350 of them and probably doing 20 completion thyroidectomies, I have yet to find a patient who has asked me to do it with a scar. Every patient says, of course, I want you to do it without a scar. And to me, that is very telling that the recovery and everything else that goes into a remote access surgery is tolerable and worth it to the patient. Um, kind of a couple of pearls because you of course have some of the really the leaders and, and especially on really that half of the United States, you really are, are fortunate to have some of the, the leaders in this field. And that's about as you step into these cancer cases, I was very deliberate about who I offered these cases to and almost everything that I did early on, I knew was benign. The first case that I did that had cancer in it was an indeterminate thyroid. And that was case number 37 that actually was the one that had cancer. And the first cancer that I told a patient that I knew had cancer was number 59. And at this point, it's become about a third and, and it's rapidly increasing to about half of the surgeries that I do that are transoral scarless surgeries are actually for cancer. Um, and the good news is that those tend to be the smaller cancers. Again, uh, as, as you get more and more facile with your ability to dissect the recurrent laryngeal nerve, I'm more and more impressed with, with the abilities of this surgery to kind of do what I need it to do and be incredibly oncologic, oncologically sound. Now, who is a candidate for this procedure? Because one thing that I didn't talk about when we try and figure out who, how far this technology will, will spread is the need for uh, what, how you treat, who gets treated for it? Is it just a niche procedure? Because if it's just a niche procedure, then, then there's no reason for everybody in the US to learn how to do it. But what, we, what I love about this procedure is that if you have a thyroid lobe that's smaller than 10 centimeters, you can do it. And if the nodule is less than six centimeters, you can do it. It's great for parathyroid surgery. I've done four gland to parathyroid explorations successfully this way um, and actually have been very impressed with it. Of course, with any parathyroid surgery, you can also be depressed, depressed with any technique. It's not all, you know, don't always feel impressed no matter what you do with parathyroid surgery. Um, it's great for indeterminate nodules. It's great for small papillary thyroid cancers, and it helps patients avoid that awkward explaining why they have a scar on their neck. This is, this is a great study that I was really excited to be a part of with a couple of colleagues from other endocrine surgery practices across the country. And what we found was by pooling all of our patients, we looked at our, our last thousand patients who had walked in the door, and we found that more than 50% of these patients were eligible for transoral scarless or scarless thyroid surgery. And, and so really it got us excited saying that there is a huge opportunity as surgeons become facile with this technique to expand this out. And I always hear from surgeons, especially early on saying, you know, I really just don't have anybody that wants this technique. And I will tell you, you know, I think Steve Jobs said it best when nobody wanted the iPhone or the iPod before there was an iPhone and an iPod. And as you learn to do this technique, and as you become more and more facile with it, patients can appreciate that. They feel it in the way that you talk to them, and more and more patients want this procedure, and it becomes more and more a part of, of what you offer. Um, as you prepare for this, and, and you, of course, your, your group knows this already, but there are some things that you certainly should do. There's a few pearls that I always like to throw out there because I wish that Engun was telling me what, I, what he does every time, because there's things that you, you kind of forget after you see things for a little while. Um, I think it's always important to have two of everything. Make sure that everybody knows how, what to be thinking about a carbon dioxide embolus. This, of course, is the room set up. Uh, another picture of how I set up my room right here. Um, and then a few changes that I've made as I've gone along. I don't do hydro dissection like I was originally taught. I don't use any cautery at all in the lip because that certainly puts things at risk of having a burn down lower. You've got to really do a lot of twisting and pointing deep because it's really embarrassing to have a small perforation in the chin from a port. Even though it heals super well, you know, this is a cosmetic surgery. Making a scar somewhere is, is kind of the whole thing that we're trying to avoid. And then there's some other techniques about things that you can do. This is a picture that you should never show an endocrinologist. And if, if, you, if Angoon had not published his full videos out there, I think a lot more patients would have transoral thyroid surgery. But when people see this picture, they say, no way, I don't want that surgery because it looks incredibly barbaric. But the final product is very elegant. And I'm just gonna show a few still screens of this and then cut to a video very quickly. Uh, 
as you, as you go through this, you, you'll see that you get a great flap that you can open up, start with the Delphian node, start up high and then slowly work down. And that way you're protecting your anominate artery, divide your isthmus so you know where your trachea is and you have a firm anatomic grasp of one fixed point. And if you're a thyroid surgeon, once you find the trachea, you essentially know where that recurrent laryngeal nerve is going to be plus or minus half a centimeter. Um, and then there's different tricks that you can use, different energy devices, start up high, kind of work down your isthmus, uh, and, and I'll show some more things. When, when you move to your superior pole, take it far lateral. And usually this, this is the one move that kind of has really sped up my surgery more than anything else is feeling comfortable going far to the lateral side and taking down that superior pole, know, knowing and trusting my energy device to be able to do that cleanly. And as you do that, you really sweep along there and you get into that beautiful plane that comes on the lateral aspect of the thyroid. And all of a sudden, wham, you're just guided straight down into the recurrent laryngeal nerve and that tracheoesophageal groove. Um, the, here's, here's another still picture of, of just coming into that groove and coming down around that superior pole. As you get down around there, you can stimulate your vagus. Um, removing the specimen, there's some tricks. Just make sure you cross your hands and make sure you dilate all the way so that you don't rupture your specimen. A lot of people can get bent up about a ruptured specimen. So do things that you need to do. Other areas for innovation that we still need to figure out, how long do patients need to be on antibiotics? Uh, I never use just clindamycin because I have had two small infections that required some, uh, some IV antibiotics. And so I've, I've always required people to go on unison or clinda plus something else. Um, and then just remember that things are coming, getting going to get better. So I, I want to show you a video. I'm going to cut just for a second, if that's okay. I'm going to stop my screen share. Uh, if I can figure this out. Oh, come on, John. Uh, it looks like, do I have the ability to stop my share? Maybe I don't have the ability. All I have right now is to stop my video. So never mind. I won't stop. I won't share that that video right this second. It doesn't look like it's going to let me stop that share and go to the video. So mo moving on, um, let's talk about things that I think are coming. And this to me is really why it's especially exciting to be a thyroid surgeon right now, because if it was just one new technique, well, that's that's great. You know, if it was just molecular markers are getting better, well, that's great, but that's going to take away some surgeries. Why is it really great to be a thyroid surgeon? You know, maybe parathyroid identification is great, but really what we're going to see in the immediate future and what's already happening there at Stanford and across the United States and the world is that we are starting to move into a brand new era of thermal ablation. And I think really this has the ability to innovate completely, not just thyroid surgery, but all of head and neck surgery. And I'm, I'm going to liken it a little bit to cardiovascular stents uh, that happened and then the stents that then moved on to vascular surgery. And I'm going to hopefully challenge all of us to think more like vascular surgeons instead of, like, instead, instead of what cardiovascular surgeon or cardiothoracic surgeons were thinking when stents came on the market a few decades ago. And, and I'm going to encourage all of us to keep an open mind and realize that this is something that really is going to change what we're doing. Thermal ablation techniques include radio frequency, laser ablation, high intensity focused ultrasound, and microwave. All of these have been used across the world for different tumors, and all of them have been used more recently in the thyroid for multiple tumor types as well. And it requires surgeons to be able to step out of the box just a little bit and realize, I am a surgeon, yes, but a surgeon doesn't just use a scalpel. A surgeon is an interventionalist. And I have within my armamentarium everything that my patient needs to be able to get the outcome that they need. So that our referring colleagues, when they think my patient needs something done on their thyroid, they don't think, oh, I need to send them to interventional radiology or, oh, I need to send them to an endocrinologist or, oh, I need to send them to anybody. They realize that I need to send them to Lisa Orloff and Julia Noel and hopefully John Russell because those people will offer surgery if surgery is what is right for my patient. But if radiofrequency ablation is better or HIFU or, or radioactive iodine or whatever it may be, those are the most qualified people because they don't just have a hammer in their toolbox. 
they have everything in their toolbox that it need, means to need that they need to get my patient the best care for themselves. So now let's step back and let's talk about radio frequency ablation. And I think it's important, like just like we talked about with, with any innovation with transoral thyroid surgery, it's got to be safe. It's got can't be inferior oncologically. It's got to be relatively cheap and it's got to be relatively applicable to everybody. And it's got to be easy to learn. And so first of all, is it safe and does it add some value to people? And there have been millions of studies, not millions, but hundreds of studies across the world at this point looking at radio frequency ablation and the value that it adds and the safety. And there is a preponderance of evidence that suggests that radio frequency ablation of thyroid nodules can be done safely and that patients can get some benefit from that. And the studies just go on and on and on. There's a gorgeous uh, the review from in 2017 from the uh, Korean Society of Radiology, who is most of the people that do radio frequency ablation in South Korea. And they did just a compilation of all of the different studies that have been done for radio frequency ablation. There's a, you all know this because Dr. Orloff and Dr. Noel are really some of the leaders in the, an ongoing project in the United States, reviewing all of the literature that's out there and really classifying just how good this has been at helping patients with benign nodules to get symptomatic relief with a very low burden or morbidity of treatment. And it helps people's symptoms move from a 3.8 down to a 1.4 on that 10 point visual analog scale. And it helps their cosmesis as well. And, and study after study has found that there is a role for this. And so then you say, okay, well, great. If there's a role and it's safe and maybe it adds some value, is it gonna be oncologically safe? And we were able to be part of a study the, from China with five years of follow-up compared to comparing surgery and radiofrequency ablation in microcarcinomas that found that there was no difference and instead found that it was, it was maybe a little bit cheaper, certainly a little bit quicker, um, and, and patients certainly appreciated it more than they appreciated their surgery. And so when you say all of these things, you can tell me, well, John, of course, but you told me that microcarcinomas don't even need to be treated. And I will tell you, you're right. They don't always need to be treated. However, in the United States, once you say the C word, once you say cancer, patients want surgery. And so if radiofrequency ablation can be safely used to encourage patients to take a less expensive, less invasive, less morbid procedure, well, then I have helped my patients and I've prevented them from having a more invasive, even though, yes, I love thyroid surgery. And I just spent the bulk of my talk telling you that I want to do transoral thyroid surgery on small cancers, right? That's what I told you I want to do. But if there is something better that may be advantageous for my patient, well, then it's my job to get on board and adopt that and learn that and see that. And that's really a lot of the innovation that's happening right now. My personal belief as we start to get into this space is that once we prove that we can do it in the thyroid, all of a sudden that opens up a window to a number of other tumors and really starts to innovate on how we treat all head and neck cancers. Um, I think really we're standing on the cusp of some really exciting things and some, and some great some great clinical trials that are going to really redefine how we treat not just thyroid pathology, but really everything. Um, kind of in, in conclusions, as we start to wrap up, I think it's important really to remember that our goals, what we're really working for is to find just the patients who need to be treated and only treat them. Don't treat everybody, kind of as, we're, as we sometimes are accused of doing with thyroid nodules and small thyroid cancers, but just treat the nodules that are going to go on to cause problems. Just treat the cancers that are going to go on to cause problems. But not only that, when we treat these patient, patients, do it with as little morbidity as possible. Do it with no scar, no pain, no cost. Do it for as everybody. And that's our goal, right? We want to be able to get this. I, I'm excited personally, even taking it one step further for a HIFU, for high intensity focused ultrasound, because you can do that by putting paddles on somebody's neck. You don't even need a needle. You don't even need local anesthetic to be able to treat people's thyroid cancers as we get better and better with this. There is so much cool stuff that's going to happen. And you, there is only so many hours in a day. And I don't know how we're going to do it. And you've just seen from my slides that you can be all over the place with all of these innovations. It is a phenomenal time to be a thyroid surgeon. And it's a phenomenal time to be stepping out and taking the lead you are so fortunate, not just because Dr. Noel and Dr. Orloff are two of the most wonderful people in the entire world, 
but because they are truly, truly leaders and visionaries in this space. And I am so fortunate to be able to work with them and other people like them as we really change and redefine how we're doing thyroid surgery and thyroid treatment. So thank you very much for putting up with my mindless drivel and my spew of consciousness that was out there, but I'm so excited about this and, and hopefully you at least felt my excitement, even if you couldn't understand anything else that I talked about there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's terrific. And you're ending with a quote from this, the famous Professor Charles W. Cummings. <laughs> Gotta love Dr. Cummings. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, thank you, John, for that uh, wonderful, inspiring overview. You're talking, you're talking to those who are in the sort of uh, one of the seats of, of innovation and design. And so it's, uh, uh, you know, I think we sometimes think that we have the corner on that in this neck of the woods, but uh, clearly, um, you know, it's it, as this uh, slide and quote um, points out, you know, we, uh, if we think that if we are complacent and just too comfortable in our knowledge of what we do now, we aren't going to see other opportunities. And you've, you've demonstrated a lot of opportunities ahead. So um, let's open it up for questions um, while we have a, a few minutes. And uh, I, uh, I think we have a chat. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody can talk, but um, we, uh, I think uh, Flavio has a question, but didn't type it in. Um, yeah, no, I, I, can, I can talk. I just wanted to, to sort of raise my hand, so to speak. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, Dr. Russell, I'm Flavio. I'm one of the PGY3 residents. Thank you so much for sharing a very inspiring talk. Uh, and also just as an aside, I uh, was glad that you, you gave a shout out to some of my previous work, actually. I was the, the leading author on the, the pupil uh, dilation uh, study from Google from when I worked there. Uh, so at some point, we can, we can chat about, uh, you know, using... This is the guy. This is the guy I need to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but my question is actually not, not about that. My question is, you know, you talk a little bit about the lateral neck and the challenges um, and I was, and, and also a little bit about, you know, robotics. And so I was curious as to what your opinion is in terms of kind of the future of this, because, you know, if you think about sort of single port robots that take up much less space, um, you know, and, and, and things like that, I was wondering, and, and, and with time, robots becoming more available and cheaper, if you think that, you know, this is really the future in some ways that you, we will be operating on the lateral neck. Uh, with uh, with these sort of smaller devices that um, you know don't don't need you know, as much space or dilation or or anything like that as it becomes more available and cheaper. Definitely, and, and certainly the single port robot is a great tool. We've done it with transoral surgery. We've done it with facelift, and and really love the single port robot. It's a great it's a great tool. Um, I I will say, so some of my colleagues, Henan Lina in Brazil is really pushing the envelope with a lot of this lateral neck dissection work. And I, I know it's coming and I think it's the right thing to do as you do it correctly. To me, it's about making sure my patients benefit. And it's easy to innovate with small thyroid cancers in the central neck because the morbidity of those cancers is so low. I, I have felt that my first responsibility with transoral thyroid surgery is making sure that people don't think that I'm a cowboy because the second that people think I'm a cowboy, all of a sudden it discredits everything else that I do. So I've got to do, I've kind of in my mind, I've, I've thought I've got to get a thousand of these on the books, you know, do a decade worth. And then people will say, all right, that guy's boring. All he does is transoral like normal surgery. And then we can say, okay, now let's start doing the lateral neck and let's do something else. So maybe Dr. Noel is the person that's going to take it to the lateral neck and she'll, and she'll beat me before I get to my thousand cases, but I, I, it's coming. I think it's a great option. I think there are patients who demand it, but we have to also think about, you know, most thyroid cancers will never kill a patient. Some thyroid cancers will, and it's the ones that spread to the lateral neck. And so, you know, that's, there's a lot of other factors that go into that decision-making. So, Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I, uh, I think that uh, you could hear John's enthusiasm throughout his talk and that, you know, <laughs> I think that tells you how exciting it is to be on the cutting edge. And um, John's an enthusiastic guy in general, but uh, I, I, I think it's, um, 
I, I appreciate your comments about uh, the, the prioritizing safety and, um, and um, non-inferiority before just uh, saying, just because you can do it, you should do it. So um, that's uh, much, much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. Well, John, I think um, it, it's, it's uh, seven o'clock and we do have our uh, residency interview debriefing to, uh, to begin at seven. So I hate to uh, cut things short, but um, I'm glad that you had the full hour to, to present uh, this exciting information and, and your perspective. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from some of our members um, independently. So we wanna thank you again for, uh, for enlightening us, for joining us this evening. And uh, like I said, we hope to have you back out here in person when COVID allows. And uh, um, we appreciate what you've done to help us move in some of the same directions that you're doing. So uh, um, thanks so much and, and stay well. Thanks, Dr. Roloff. Chris, John, that was, I'm an otologist, but I found that inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Dr. Jacqueline. <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks, John. <laughs> thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you for the invitation again. <laughs> you bet. <laughs>